Hi guys, happy Wine Wednesday. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. If you're a Wednesday regular, thank you so much for coming back and spending every single Wednesday with me. I love and I appreciate you guys so much. Thanks for voting yes on like the costumes continuing because I'm having fun. Since today's story is like Boogie Nights inspired, I was going for that like Studio 54 disco vibe. I am so sorry, I forgot the riddle last week and you guys called me out on it real quick so before i forget again let's do today's all right the riddle is what is higher without a head than it is with one cannot wait to see your answers you guys are so smart though you always nail it we are gonna get right into it today before we do though sherilyn of the past has a message for you before we get started, muchas gracias to our sponsor today, Babbel. As you know, I was doing some double time on the Babbel app to prepare for our move to Mexico. Even though the move did not go as we planned it, I was still so excited to use and practice a lot of the words and phrases that I learned while we were down there. And I was actually really impressed with myself. You guys already know I am planning on going back for a few visits throughout the winter. So my learning is still not done. And I don't plan on stopping it anytime soon, especially once I've actually seen like my capabilities firsthand. For instance, Oriana met a little friend at the pool and she only spoke Spanish. And so I got to kind of be like the interpreter to like get them introduced, get them warmed up. And then, you know, kids will be kids. They can just like find entertainment with each other, whether they speak the language or not. But it was like really cool that I was like, oh, I know what you're trying to tell her. And then I could like translate for Oriana to the little girl and they just like made a budding relationship. I don't know what it was, but I also felt so excited each night at dinner when I was able to like request a table. I was all, una mesa para ses, por favor. It just felt so cool. So my language journey won't just stop just because our plans got derailed a little bit. If anything, I'm more motivated just to be like better prepared in the future for all of the vacations that I plan on taking. I just wanna get better and better. And my suggestion to you is if you wanna learn a language, don't wait for a trip to do so. It's never too early to learn it and just like have the skill so you're prepared. Right now, Babbel is offering my true crime family members 65% off on their app which works out to like a little less than $5 a month. And to me, that's just like unbelievable when you think about it because we have really good friends who had to take English as a second language course when they came to Canada. And I'm telling you right now, it was not $5 a month. And they also didn't have like a lot of flexibility in their learning style. So like on the app, there are so many different features you can choose to listen to a podcast, they have games on there. They have their daily lesson plans, which you can make like under 10 minutes. And then they also have virtual classes that are taught by a teacher, which is really nice if you kind of like that like instructor student setting. I can honestly say after trying other apps, my personal opinion when it comes to Babbel is that I have not received the same, I guess, caliber in terms of learning practical to the point like real life scenario conversations. Babbel's got that nailed. I can't wait to learn more. I can't wait to hear what you guys are gonna learn. Thank you again so much Babbel for this amazing offer and for sponsoring today's video. Te amo. All right, if you don't have your goodies and whatever you need to get all snuggled in, get that ready and let's get started. This case is to this day still known as one of the most gruesome crime scenes that LA detectives have ever seen. And this happened in 1981. So, you know, like given that many years, oh my God, I'm like, I was born not that long after 1981. And I'm like, oh, it was like 40 years ago. Given as it happened like 40 years ago, it gives you a good idea of what they were working with after all of these years if they're still talking about it. Another thing that keeps it on people's lips is that in typical Hollywood fashion, it had it all. It had drugs, millions of dollars being tossed around, and a porn star known for his massive dingling. He is actually who Mark Wahlberg's character was based off of in Boogie Nights. I'm telling you, it does have like everything for a Hollywood movie script. If the writers had followed the accurate story though, it would have been a horror movie, not like a dramedy. 
We are talking about the murders of the Wonderland Gang, AKA the Shameful Seven. Thank you so much to one of our True Crime fam members for suggesting this. I have searched high and low for your comment that I had saved so I could give you a proper shout out and I cannot find it to save my life. So if that is you, please let me know in the comments below. And I thank you so much ahead of time. All right, the series of events that unfolded and led to a quadruple murder all started on June 29th, 1981, when a robbery took place at a very very well-known drug dealer's house named Eddie Nash. Eddie, also known as Adele Nasrallah, had arrived in the United States in like the mid-1950s from Lebanon and he came with just $7 in his pocket. It's one of those stories where he did some small jobs here and there and then he just went to go pursue the American dream by opening up his own business. He started with just a small hot dog stand on Hollywood Boulevard and then from there went on to own several nightclubs in the Hollywood area. He owned The Seven Seas, The Odyssey, The Starwood, Alibaba's, Sold Out, and The Kit Kat Club. And I read that he had a club that kind of fit anybody's vibe. So if there was something particular that you liked and were looking for, one of his clubs would like suit your fancy. The Kit Kat was a topless dance club. The Seven Seas had this like tropical motif going, very Polynesian vibe. The menu had like nice fruity drinks. Sometimes belly dancers came and entertained. It sounds really cool. I read that his gay club was the first one that hit LA that allowed same-sex dancing, which when you actually process that, it's quite ridiculous that in like the 80s, it doesn't feel that long ago that that wasn't allowed. It was said that like all in total with his businesses and the real estate that he owned, he was worth about $30 million. He did dabble a little bit in the Hollywood scene. He was doing some work as a stuntman on certain movies. That's actually how he got his name, Eddie Nash. He was was a stuntman for the Cisco Kid and the character that he played in there, his name was Nash and it just stuck. His personality is described as quite harsh. He was also kind of like a shyster. The food in his establishments were like rip-off proportions. The drinks were known to be very, very watered down. You know, that kind of vibe. But he didn't really care because all of his businesses were basically just a shield for his far more lucrative business, which was the drug trade. He is known for being one of the biggest narcotics dealers and organized crime members in Los Angeles history. It was no secret to anybody what Eddie was up to, even with law enforcement. All of his establishments were just like regular subjects of raids that would happen on a weekly basis, most times even multiple times a week. So it goes without saying that even in the drug trade world, he had a big target on his back and a group of men took their shot on the morning of June 29th, 1981. Everybody knew that Eddie kept a lot of drugs and money at his house. As much as he was a dealer, he was also heavily dependent on narcotics. His habit was so heavy that he actually lost part of his nasal cavity and one of his lungs was also removed. So everybody knew that at any given time, there was gonna be a plethora of drugs at his house. So it's the middle of the night on June 29th, 1981, and three men pretending to be law enforcement show up at Eddie's house at 3315 Donna Lola Place and bust through his patio. Bust through, I just spat everywhere. They bust into Eddie's startled 300 pound bodyguard named Greg Diles. He's also a karate expert. So he charges at them, but the three of them work together and they're able to overpower him and get him handcuffed. While this whole commotion is going on, one of the assailant's guns goes off and it grazes his back. So it was like a superficial wound, but the noise wakes up Eddie Nash. Eddie comes barreling into the room. And as soon as he sees Eddie, he knows like there's, there's no chance for him to overpower anybody if he couldn't. Did I say Eddie or Greg? I meant Greg. So Eddie's at their mercy. He just drops to his knees begging for his life and he tells them to take anything they want. They say they want him to unlock his safe and they start directing him exactly where it is. So they're like familiar with the lay of the land. He unlocks it, they clean it out and they make out with over a million dollars worth of drugs, jewelry, weapons, and cash. Before they leave, they cut the phone lines just in case Eddie is gonna wanna call for help. It'll give them like a little bit of time to get away. Eddie clearly didn't wanna call for help, at least not from the police. I can only imagine like how that phone call would go like, um, yes, hello. Someone stole all my drugs and my drug money and my weapons. Please help. Okay, thanks, bye. Instead, he takes to the streets and he summons all of his henchmen. And he's like, I want you guys to find out who did this. He is livid. Not so much for the 
theft, but more so for like humiliating him, like making him be on his hands and knees, begging for mercy, begging for his life, and just like willingly like cleaning out his stuff and just giving away his possessions to these people. So they head out and they run into a friend slash acquaintance that is well known to Eddie. His name is John Holmes and he's wearing a ring that was just stolen from Eddie's house. John is not only just known to Eddie, he's also known on the Hollywood scene. He was really quite famous in the 70s for being one of the top earning porn stars. His full name was John Curtis Holmes. He was born on August 8th, 1944 in rural Ohio to Marion Edward Holmes. He was the youngest of four kids. The Holmeses had three boys and a girl. When he was only three, his parents got a divorce. I guess his dad was quite a heavy drinker. John remembers his dad would get so drunk, like even at a young age of like three, and he'd be stumbling around the house. Oftentimes he threw up so violently, he'd like throw up on the children too. I guess you wouldn't forget that. So his mom moved herself and the kids out and they went to a housing project in Columbus. When John was eight years old, his mother remarried a man named Harold. Harold also had his struggles. He suffered from depression and relied a lot on the bottle to self-medicate. John had a really bad relationship with him. So when he was 16 years old, he left home. He didn't really tell people his life story though. He made one up and his story was that a rich aunt is who raised him. They lived in a bunch of different places like Florida, Michigan, London, Paris. She was like a socialite who was married like 15 times. He said he lived a life of privilege, did bougie sports like fencing, went to etiquette class. But really after he left his family home at 16, he joined the US Army and served in Germany for three years. When he was discharged, he moved to California and really quickly he met a nurse named Sharon Jabeni. She was young, in love, saw the stars in her eyes. And not long after they met, they were married in August 1965 in Fort Ord, California. He was bouncing from job to job. Sharon had a really stable job. She was actually part of a team of students and medical professionals that were trying to like nail down open heart surgery. And I think John probably felt like a little bit inferior. He didn't have a lot of skills academically, but what he did have, he used to his advantage and started making money behind his wife's back in the porn industry. Initially, she had no idea what was going on. And then one day when she came home early from work, she catches him and he's like nude in the bathroom, like measuring his bits. And he just like kind of blurts out like, this is what I'm doing. She's not happy about it, but he's like, you know what? It is what it is. Like you just either accept it or you don't. I have a gift and I'm going to use it. During this time, the porn industry was booming in South California. So it took very little time for John to make it to the top. And really soon he was being called the king of porn. He made 2,274 films. Among some of the titles were Liquid Lips, China Cat, Tapestry of Passion. And it's estimated that he got busy with around 14,000 women. He was a top earner in the industry. He was making like $3,000 a day on film sets. He also was charging about that much for like any private extracurricular clients that he was taking on. According to legend, he was packing about 11 to 15 inches, but his career had recently taken a dive quite literally because he was getting heavily addicted to addicted addicted to drugs and it was preventing him from like performing properly. It was almost like in an instant he went from huge success to broke. He was funding his habit primarily through theft. He would rack up his wife's credit card by like buying appliances and then like selling them on the streets for money or exchanging them for drugs. Another thing he would do was go to the airport and then wait for luggage to come off the conveyor belt and like steal it and sell whatever was in there. He also had a young mistress that he would use to also go and do work and take that money from her. So his two main sources that supplied his habit were Eddie Nash and also a group called the Wonderland Gang. Like Eddie, they were very well known in the underground world. Their group consisted of four main members and they all lived together at 8763 Wonderland Avenue in Laurel Canyon. Ron Lanis, he was known as the leader. 
I guess he was very ruthless, feared among anybody that he met, just zero Fs given about anything in life, and multiple people who met him described him as the coldest person they'd ever met. He was born in Sacramento in 1944. In the 60s, he fought in the Vietnam War. He was in the Air Force, but he was dishonorably discharged when he got involved in the drug trade in Vietnam, and he was caught smuggling drugs in the caskets of dead soldiers the fuck is wrong with people after getting the boot he went back to sacramento and that's when he got all caught up in the drug trade over there he had been investigated for several murders he was arrested for one of a police informant but before trial started that informant died apparently it was from like an unrelated police shootout it led to him being acquitted Billy Deverell also lived in the house. He was known as Ron's like right-hand man. He grew up in the all-American family, but just fell into the wrong crowd, got caught up in the lifestyle, and then just ultimately got to the point where he couldn't fight his addiction anymore. I read that as ruthless as Ron was, Billy was kind of like the balance. He had empathy in his heart, and he often struggled with depression, just trying to like process and accept the life he was living and the things that he was witnessing. Joy Miller was Billy's girlfriend and she was the one who the house was under. She on paper had the most credentials. She kind of like had lived this suburban housewife life. She was married to a successful lawyer, had two kids, but unfortunately got addicted to drugs. She left her family and moved in with Billy. Susan Lannis also lived in the house. She was Ron's wife as well as a man named Tracy McCord who was another associate of Ron's who also had a rap sheet. At the end of June, the Wonderland gang had had two visitors visiting them. Their names were David Lynn and Barbara Richards. David was an associate of Ron's and him and Barbara were also behind the scenes police informants. But he and Ron had met in prison and then Ron asked him to come out to LA to help get his empire like really booming they approached it kind of like this is an initiation to like come into the wonderland gang barbara like the other women in the house didn't really fit the lifestyle she was born october 17th 1959 she was from a suburban working class family in sacramento she was briefly married but that didn't work out and not too long after she left her husband she met david he was quite a bit older than her so i think that was like the initial appeal and he ran with a rougher crowd than what she was used to. She had no criminal record. She was very close to her family, but they started to drift apart when she met David and they didn't really know anything about him. John Holmes also spent a lot of time at the Wonderland property. They considered him more like an errand boy though, but in his mind, he felt badass just like hanging out with them. But it's his desire to be hard and an intricate part of the drug world that sets off the unfolding of events that led to a murder that's so gruesome to this day, it's still compared to the crime scene of the Manson killings. It's around 3 a.m. on July 1st, two days after the robbery at Eddie Nash's house. A group of assailants arrive at the Wonderland property. They're armed with metal pipes and hammers and without going into detail basically they massacred ron bill joy and barbara richardson barbara was on the couch she didn't even have a single defensive wound on her so it implies that she was caught off guard while she was sleeping and the only thing that you can hope is that she just didn't wake up after like an initial blow and didn't feel any pain upstairs was billy deverell and joy miller It looked like they must have heard some commotion going on downstairs because Billy was in the process of getting out of the bed to the door and there were defensive wounds and signs that he was trying to fight for his and Joy's life. And also from looking at the scene, it appeared that Joy was trying to flee, but she didn't stand a chance. Ron and Susan were found in their bedroom. Again, it did look like Ron tried to fight off his attackers. Susan was also found in the bedroom, believed to be dead, but miraculously she survived after being left on the floor for 12 hours. She was found when a moving crew that was moving their neighbors out had heard like her groaning and they were like, what the hell is that noise? Where is it coming from? 
led into the house and they found her. It's truly a miracle that she survived. And what's awful is there were two opportunities for someone to call for help and save her earlier than 12 hours. I guess associates of the gang were trying to call the house phone and they couldn't get through to anybody, but they really were trying to get their fix. So they go to the house, see that the doors open, walk into this like grisly scene and they're just like stepping over bodies rooting through all the drawers trying to find money or like drugs and they see Susan and she's kind of like moaning but they're like oh she's like pretty much like on her way out so we'll just leave. So finally, she's rushed to hospital to get some help. Obviously, they start their investigation right away. And they know based off people in the area and then also just by other calls that had gone out to the scene that this was like a known drug house. So initially they thought maybe this was a drug deal gone bad, but really quickly, like just looking at the scene, they're like, no, this is ghastly. This is revenge of some sort. It's the early 80s, so they're not working with DNA right now. So they're just like meticulously going through the scene and trying to find like fingerprints. They're able to pull a few successfully and one specifically really interests them from Ron and Susan's bedpost in their bedroom and it doesn't match either of them. Fast forward a couple days, they're going through all their police work and they get a call from someone named Fat Howard. He says he's got some information for the police and he wants to meet them at the scene of the crime. So they rush over, they meet Fat Howard and he's kind of just like a flustered mess. He says that his really good friend who was Barbara's boyfriend is in Inside the house having an absolute breakdown. So they go in, weapons drawn, not sure what to expect. And they find David Lind. He is an absolute wreck. He just keeps asking where Barbara is. On the night of the killings, he was on a bender in a hotel. So he wasn't at the house. And when he heard what happened, it was over the news and the media was reporting that there was a female survivor. So he thought that it was Barbara. Before telling him like, sorry, my dude, it's not her, they want to bring him in because they're hopeful that maybe they'll get a chance to get like some questions out of him. So they're like, okay, we'll let you know what's going on. Just like come to the station with us first. Pretty much as soon as they get there, they tell him, okay, like Barbara didn't make it. And he just like goes over the edge. I guess he had a bunch of pills in his pocket. So he just like starts like showing them. He's like, oh, this is my purple pill. This is my blue one. And he just starts piling pills into his face. The police leave him for a minute, hoping he's gonna calm down. Probably not the most professional of interviews, but they're like, you know what? I think he's gonna start talking, so let's just ride this out and see what happens. Which works. He goes through bouts where he's like hysterically crying for Barbara, and then he just starts raging how she didn't deserve this. this. He was the one who brought her into this life. It should have been him. And the police are like, okay, well, we want to help you and we want to get justice for her. So you've got to help us. They start with the easiest question. Like, who do you think did this? And he's like, I know who did this. It was John Holmes. John the Peen Holmes. <laughs> I don't know where that, that wasn't his nickname. Sorry. They're like the porn star. And he's like, yeah. It should have been John the Peen Holmes. He said this all unfolded because John set up a robbery at Eddie Nash's house two days before the murders. By this point, he's like pretty blitzed. And he just goes on to say that he knows the details of the robbery because he's also involved. He says that it was him, Billy, Ron, and Tracy that carried it out. And John kind of set things up earlier in the day and put the whole thing in motion for them. His task was to visit Eddie earlier on in the day and then leave the patio door open for them so that it was easier to get in. I guess they all mapped it out at Wonderland. They were sitting at the kitchen table. John was a regular of Eddie's and and Eddie considered him kind of like a friend. So he was just going to go as normal to Eddie's, pick up some drugs and find an excuse to go into the house. The plan was for him to get like a clear visual of valuables that were out that day. So where they were located in what room and then come back to them and draw it out on the map. As they're going through this plan, they're getting pretty stoned and it gets to the point where John is like, second guessing himself because he had already gone earlier on in the day they're writing out where he found like the weapons where he thinks the safe is and then he starts 
thinking, okay, like the number one piece of this puzzle is that I'm supposed to leave the patio door open and he couldn't remember if he did. So he's got to go back in the evening and he just comes up with an excuse that he's already done the drugs that he already picked up. So he needs to grab more. And while he's at it, he also needs to use the bathroom. So he goes back in, the patio door was unlocked, but he just, you know, confirms that it's unlocked. David said then him, Billy, and Ron busted through the patio door. It was him who accidentally shot Greg. And he was really believable. Like he had details that I don't think you would like think to share. Like he told the police that they had dipped their fingers in liquid bandage before they left so that they wouldn't leave fingerprints at the house when they got there. And he said he knew that that robbery had to be the cause of what happened because he could just see in Eddie's face how humiliated he was. And just based on his personality, it wouldn't be something that he would be able to handle. I guess Ron was pushing to just kill Eddie and Greg, but David was like, no, we don't need to kill anybody. Talked him off the ledge and convinced him to leave. They cut the phone lines and then just booked it into the car that Tracy was waiting in and then they hauled ass. When they asked him like, okay, well, it sounds like John was with you guys. Like he's your buddy. Why would he turn on you? David said there was a falling out after they arrived back at Wonderland where John got a noticeably smaller cut than everybody else and he was livid about it. He takes his portion, which includes this ring of Eddie's, and leaves pretty salty. The investigators are getting some good information and they struggled with, I think this guy can help us. So we don't really want to arrest him for like the crimes that he's implicating himself in. We need to build his trust. So they tell him they'll let him go if he continues to cooperate, which he does. For the next few days, they go around town interviewing people who knew Eddie, who knew John, who knew the Wonderland gang. And the common consensus is that John had to be involved. He's described by many as quite wormy, like, a try hard, always stealing like everybody's things. You just couldn't trust him. Always broke and just constantly scheming for the next way to make money. The rumor on the street is that when Greg Diles sees Eddie's ring on John, he lures him back to Eddie's house. He says Eddie's got some stuff for him, so John goes. When they get there, he just like tosses him across the room, ties him up to a chair, beats the crap out of him. Eddie comes in and he's just screaming at him like, I know you were involved. How could you do this to me? I call you my brother. I trusted you. Apparently, Eddie grabs John's address book and he starts going through it and he writes down the names of John's family members and their addresses. And he says like, if you don't confess to what you did and who was involved, I'm going to go to your family's house and I'm going to kill them. We don't know what happened, but it's believed that if this is true, John told Eddie everything that happened with the robbery and agreed to participate in the retaliation because police discovered that that partial fingerprint that was found in Ron and Susan's bedroom matched John's and there was no reason for him to be in the bedroom. Anybody who knew the Wonderland gang all said that like Ron would never allow John in this room. So the only way he could have been there was if he was there the night of the murders. Sounds like, you know, like really promising, a lot of steam rolling, but then everybody starts talking and this is pretty much all the police have. In this world, nobody wants to cooperate or give information. Their last attempt at talking to anybody that could be involved was going to see Tracy McCord, who happened to be in jail at the time on unrelated charges. And it almost seemed like he was really bored and he just wanted to talk with somebody. And the only information that he gave them was things that they already knew that yes, he was the getaway driver and that he knew that John was upset that his cut was smaller than everybody else's. So their next hope was that they would use Eddie and John to turn on each other. They start with Eddie. I guess police rushed his house. They had like grenades, SWAT team. They just like busted through, coming in at all angles. They arrest Gregory, who has been putting his job description through the ringer because he gets arrested on the pool table and he's butt naked. They arrest Eddie too, but I guess he's more upset that they like broke his door. He kind of had this air about him that like he was untouchable, which I guess he proved was right because he didn't even spend a night in jail that night. He posted bail and went back home. On July 12th, they apprehend John. He's at a hotel in San Francisco. 
and they're gonna arrest him on grand theft auto charges, but they figure this is an opportunity to try to schmooze him, see if he'll turn on Eddie. So they actually bring him to a hotel in LA. They like put him up, wine and dine him, trying to get him all like loose and comfortable and trusting. And they start to ask about the robbery and the murders. Again, the only information that he provides them is stuff they already know. And he just confirms that he was the one who went to Eddie's house and left the patio door unlocked for the Wonderland gang to go in. He said he personally made out with about $2,000 in drugs and cash from that robbery. And then he leaves like a little breadcrumb and he says that he may have been coerced in leaving a door unlocked at Wonderland as well. But when it came to providing any names or further information, he just turned into a vault. Even when they were like, it's going to get to the point where if you're not giving anybody else up, you're going to be like the only option to arrest. And he was like, so be it. They let him go though, because they're hoping to build more trust with him like they had with David, but he flees. I mean, you can't trust this guy as far as you can throw him. That was like a no-brainer. So a few months go by. They still don't know where he is. They go to his wife and she eventually gives up that the last time she talked to him, he was in Florida and he was with his girlfriend. She did add more to the speculation that John was present during the killings. She said she saw John around the time of the murders and he was bloodied and bruised but she couldn't remember the exact date that it was. She also added that she wasn't sure if it was the same incident, but one night John told her that he was forced to be a witness to a murder, but didn't say who was killed, where it was, or who was involved, and she didn't press it. So now police know that he's on the run with his girlfriend, so they go to his girlfriend's brother, and they're like, listen, you have to convince her to give him up. Her life is in danger, like we need to get him behind Bars. The brother says it wasn't too long ago that he spoke to her and he thinks that they're in Miami. So on November 30th, the police fly out to Florida. They find John's girlfriend and they convince her to cooperate. She says he's at the Fountainhead Motel in room 41. He's under the name John Wade. He's in a little bit of a disguise. He's dyed his hair black, changed up the mustache, and he's parked his car up the road a bit. And it used to be navy blue, but they spray painted it black before they went to Florida. So about eight officers go and stake out the hotel. When they first see John, he leaves his hotel room and goes into the room next door. And then not long after, he goes back into his room and he leaves the door open because there's like a cool breeze that evening and he's trying to like cool the room down. So it's like perfect opportunity. They bust in. I guess briefly he's got this like look of surprise and then he recognizes the first officer that had interviewed him before and he's like, what took you so long? Well, I don't know, John, you ran away. So he's flown back to LA and charged with four counts of murder and an attempted murder on Susan's life. Susan was still alive, but she did suffer severe brain trauma. She wasn't really able to recall anything from that evening that would help prosecutors. The only thing that she says she remembered was just seeing shadowy figures in her room, seeing like shiny metal, like kind of like flying about. She said she was trying to call for her husband, but like a nightmare, she couldn't like form words and then she would just pass out. So she wasn't able to give a description of anybody. She couldn't identify like even John who would be somebody that she would recognize because she knew. What they hoped for was that once John was in jail, after he had like some time to stew there, he would turn on Eddie as well as whoever it was that apparently Eddie had hired. To John, they were kind of insinuating that Gregory and Eddie were preparing to like save their own butts. So before they, you know, jumped at the opportunity, he should take a deal first so that then he, you know, could implicate them and then they couldn't get a deal. They didn't think that Eddie had personally done anything, but they had no doubt that if the rumor was true and he was involved in this, he knew the people that could carry this out and he had them do it for him. But John never gave anything up. He was willing to gamble with his freedom. And during the trial, Jurge just felt like he wasn't somebody who was capable of carrying out a murder. His lawyer argued that he was as much of a victim as anybody else and that his life was being threatened by somebody and he had no choice 
but to participate in some capacity and be witness to a crime. So just based on substantial lack of evidence and a lot of reasonable doubt, he was acquitted. Eddie and Greg were arrested and next to go on trial. John was subpoenaed to testify in court, but he refused. So he was arrested and held in contempt for 110 days. Again, he wouldn't crack. He didn't share any information. And that trial ended in a hung jury. The vote was 11 to 1 guilty with one juror that just would not change his vote. So they were tried again. And this time, since there was only one holdout juror on the last case, prosecutors thought like, okay, like this is it. We know where our holes are, but they were both acquitted of all charges. Eddie did later go to jail several times after the trial on drug-related crimes. Greg also went to jail for assaulting a deputy. In 2000, Eddie was charged with racketeering, drug charges, and also trying to bribe a juror on the Wonderland case. The solo guy that like held out. There was also a conspiracy to commit murder charge in there for the Wonderland murder. And Eddie pleaded guilty to everything except for the conspiracy to commit murder charge. He paid a $250,000 fine and only had to spend four years in jail. This case is technically unsolved, even though there are so many people that believe that Eddie was responsible and that John was involved. There just has never been like a solid lead that has led to anything concrete. And now at this point, the likelihood of anything being solved now is really slim because so many of the key players are dead. Greg died of liver failure in 1997. John died in 1988 due to complications from AIDS. David died of an overdose in 1995. The getaway driver Tracy McCord died in 2006. And Eddie Nash died in 2014. I don't know where I sit. I really don't think John was an aggressor. Like, I don't think that he was responsible for actually, like, murdering somebody. I do think he was, like, really wormy, like people explained him. Just based on the crime scene, like, you've got to be, like, all types of like messed up to be able to like carry out something that gruesome and I just don't think he had it in him and Eddie had a lot of power a lot of connections if he did hire somebody I don't think it's anybody that was ever on anyone's radar just based on the fact that he was like I'm just gonna keep doing me like he continued to like run this drug ring his house was raided all of the time and he was always just really confident that at the very least he would never be charged with murder I don't know that's where I'm at like I just feel like he was too comfortable I want to know what you guys think though. I love to hear your theories. You always have me thinking like outside the box, small little details that I like might not have even picked up on. All right, that is it for me today, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to share, spread the word. Look at those numbers, you guys. We are so close, just climbing every day and I'm so thankful. Speaking of, if you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It really does mean the world to me. You know I love and I appreciate you so, so much. Oh, the answer to today's riddle, if you need a reminder, what is higher without a head than with one? And the answer is a pillow. A pillow. I'm sure all of you got it. You're all so brilliant. I love you. I love this community we have built together. You guys truly are the best. All right, that's enough from me. I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly until then. Make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.